As frequent attendees know, the views expressed or the perspectives conveyed during these lectures do not in any way represent the official views of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, let me briefly introduce the subject of tonight's debate. Democracy in the Middle East, a distant dream? A few months ago, the Carnegie Endowment, a Washington-based think tank, published a survey entitled Arab Voices, for which interviews were conducted with 93 opinion leaders from the Middle East and North Africa. Mahayaya, one of our speakers, may elaborate a little bit more on, uh, on, this, um, on this survey, but I will say a few words about it. Of these 93 persons interviewed, only four expressed positive views of their governments. And the respondents were not just representatives of civil society, but also academics, former members of parliament, and former advisors of heads of state. The vast majority of these individuals were highly critical about the relationship between the state and its citizens in their country. Some of the quotes illustrate just how bleak the situation was considered by the persons interviewed. Someone from Syria said, for instance, the relationship is based on fear and terror and the implicit rejection of authority by the vast majority of citizens. And a woman who preferred to remain anonymous said, there is no relationship at all. A similar picture transpired from other surveys, such as the Arab Opinion Index. Moreover, this index shows that the population in Arab countries sees a clear connection between the crisis in governance and the chaos and instability in the region. As transpires from this index, um, Arab populations generally consider support for democratic transitions as one of the most important means of countering violent extremism and instability. However, despite the indications transpiring from surveys and indexes, change in governance seems to arrive slowly in the Middle East, as the Arab uprisings have clearly demonstrated. One of the researchers of the Arab Voices report I just mentioned is Marwan Washer, a former Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister of Jordan. He wrote in a recent opinion article, the Arab uprisings brought to the fore the inadequacy of the region's outdated social contracts in the face of current political and economic challenges. Yet, Arab governments still seem not to have gotten the message. Five years after the uprisings erupted, Arab citizens have little and in some cases even less voice in running their country's affairs. This is the end of the quote. Nevertheless, according to Muasher, poor governance today does not mean the Arab world is doomed to failure. He mentions, for instance, Tunisia as a beacon of hope, writing, after the 2011 revolution, it pursued a consensual inclusive process to develop a new social contract that upholds all of its people's individual and collective rights. Yet, and this brings us to the central topic of today's uh, lecture and debate, the general state of affairs in the Middle East does beg the question, why do political transitions and social and economic reforms seem so elusive? in the Middle East? And why does authoritarianism seem so resilient? Fortunately enough, tonight we're accompanied by three excellent speakers who are able to shed some light on these complex questions. And I will now move on to introduce the first speaker to you. That's Eva Bellin. Eva is professor of Arab politics at Brandeis University in the United States where she focuses on comparative politics and transition processes. She has published extensively on issues of democratization and authoritarian persistence, political and economic reform, civil society, and religion and politics. She's the author of Stalled Democracy, Capital Labor, and the Paradox of State-Sponsored Development, and the co-author of the very recently published building rule of law in the Arab world. 
Eva has contributed to numerous edited books and published in a variety of venues, amongst others on the Arab uprisings and democracy in the Middle East. She's also been a Carnegie Scholar and a Princeton University Fellow. She has conducted, conducted field research in Tunisia, Egypt, Israel, and Pakistan. Eva, we're very much looking forward to hearing your views on the questions I just outlined. Please give Eva Bellen a warm welcome. Well, I want to say first, it's such an honor uh, to be here. And I should say that um, I travel a fair amount and give lots of public talks, but usually, well, not public talks, give talks usually just to other um, academics and policy experts. I rarely get to talk to people in other countries. So this is very exciting to me, very exciting to talk to publicly engaged people in uh, the Netherlands. That's just a privilege. And then to do it in this center of uh, public debate with all the um, history of debate in this space and to be part of that tradition um, is very, very exciting for me. Um, all right, well, let's get to the subject at hand. I've been asked to address two questions. Uh, the first is, why has democracy proven so elusive in the Middle East and North Africa? And the second, what are the prospects? What are the prospects for a democratic transition in the near future? So let me start with the first question. Why has democracy proven so elusive in the Middle East and North Africa? And to answer this question effectively, I want to first put aside three commonly held explanations uh, for the democratic deficit in the region. Uh, these are ac explanations that I actually don't think are very helpful to explain the elusiveness of democracy in the region today, and I don't think they are helpful in helping us think about how to change the situation in the future. So, first commonly held explanation for why democracy has proven elusive in this part of the world has focused on popular culture. And the argument goes, the majority of people in the region are not culturally committed to liberal democratic values. They don't believe in gender equality. They don't believe in political pluralism. They are not committed to the free exchange of beliefs and ideas. And so it's this cultural orientation that explains why democracy has not been able to take root in this part of the world. Now, I'm not going to get into whether this depiction of popular culture in the region is accurate or not. There is a lot of debate about this. If you look at the polls, you look at the Pew Charitable Trust polls, you look at the Arab Barometer polls, they don't agree on what popular culture, what popular beliefs actually are. I'm actually indifferent to that debate because to me it almost seems beside the point. The truth is that comparative evidence shows, and this is going to, I'm afraid, infuriate my colleague Iyad, um, that at least in the short, and medium term, popular values don't really matter much when it comes to determining the success or failure of democratic transition. And by that, I by democratic transition, I simply mean the installation of free and fair competitive elections for the allocation of political power. Okay, that's the first step for a democratic transition. It's a minimalist definition. It's not the last word on democracy, but that's what we mean by democratic transition. Now, if you look around the world, you will not find a strong correlation between popular commitment to liberal democratic values and successful democratic transition. There was no dramatic shift in popular culture in sub-Saharan Africa in the early 1990s prior to the wave of transition that swept that continent. And yet, the wave, the democratization wave occurred. There was no dramatic transition in popular culture in Latin America in the 1980s prior to the wave of transition that swept that continent, and yet that continent transitioned as well. So the connection between popular values and regime type, very loose and imprecise, at least in the short and medium term. So I don't think it makes much sense to focus on popular culture, whatever that may be, as the best explanation for why democratic transition has proven so scarce in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, a second commonly held explanation 
for the elusiveness of democracy also points to the region's cultural endowment. This explanation focuses specifically on the region's religious tradition and it focuses on the prevalence of Islam and the teachings of Islam, which many say is in fundamental conflict with the ideas of democracy. Because Islam doesn't recognize a separation of religion and politics, because Islam does not recognize the notion of popular sovereignty, because Islam uh, rejects the li basic liberal democratic values such as equality before the law and freedom of thought and belief. Now again, I'm not going to get into what the true message of Islam is. There are many interpretations of this religious tradition, just as there are many interpretations of any religious tradition. I'm going to leave the question of interpretation aside. Comparative evidence, I'm a comparativist, comparative evidence again suggests that this concern about religion generally, and Islam in particular, is misplaced. And it's misplaced for two reasons. First, as my colleague, Al Stepan, a professor at Columbia University, has pointed out, there are a fair number of Muslim-majority countries that have managed to sustain democracies without abandoning their religious roots. Think about Indonesia. Think about Malaysia. Think about Senegal. There's no reason to assume that majority commitment to Islam precludes successful democratization. And second, the concern that Islam claims a role in the public sphere, that it's not just a matter of private conscience, need not be seen as an obstacle to democratization. Successful democratization need not assume complete separation of religion and politics. And that's actually something I learned from Western Europe. I didn't know that from the United States. It's only when I began studying the whole question of separation of religion and state in the European context that I realized how well the two can be combined. As you know, most Western European countries establish religion to some degree, not like in the US. And that has led to certain compromises of pure liberal practice and pure equality before the law. We see this with France's struggle with permitting women to wear the veil in public, something which sounds very odd to American ears. We see this in Germany's struggle to recognize and afford equal treatment to all religions. The point is, we see widespread establishment of religion, and this need not prove fatal to democracy. It may lead to uh, some inconsistencies and some imperfections in the democracy in upholding liberal democratic values, but this need not mean the death of democracy. It simply means imperfect democracy, and we are all imperfect, and we are all works in progress. The third commonly held explanation for the failure of democracy to take hold in the region points to socioeconomic conditions. We correctly associate healthy democracy with successful socioeconomic development. The more developed a country is, the more likely its democracy will be robust. And hence, we have this tendency to think that perhaps democracy has failed to take root in the Middle East and North Africa because of developmental deficits, high poverty rates, low literacy rates, other socioeconomic failures. But in fact, socioeconomic failings cannot explain the region's exceptional resistance to democratization. Because in fact, the Middle East and North Africa is not exceptionally underdeveloped. To the contrary, the Middle East and North Africa as a region has the lowest poverty rate of any developing region in the world. The lowest percentage of people living on less than $2 a day. And the region's performance on other, many other socioeconomic indicators, literacy rates, longevity, surpasses those of many other regions of the world that have enjoyed transition to democracy, most notably Sub-Saharan Africa. Far perform Sub-Saharan Africa on socioeconomic indicators, falls far behind in terms of democratization. So let's put aside those simplistic explanations. And now let me turn to you to the three factors, I think, that are much more powerful uh, at explaining the region's exceptional resistance to democratization. Now, the first has to do with the strength of the state in so many countries in the region, and more specifically, the strength of what I'll call the coercive apparatus in many of these countries and the capacity to repress democratic initiatives. 
To my mind, this was one of the most important factors that explained why this region evaded the third wave of democratization, that wave of democratization that spread to every other region in the world during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And this is something I've written a great deal about. Um, I argue that it is, or was, the persistent capacity and will of this coercive apparatus, I mean by that the military primarily, but also police, the persistent capacity and will of the course of apparatus in the Middle East and North Africa to repress democratic initiatives that swept uh, dur during this period. And let me tell you where this insight came from, why I began to focus so much on this coercive apparatus and the strength of the state. It came to me when I was following democratic transition in sub-Saharan Africa in the 1990s. Um, on that continent, people rose up demanding democracy, demanding political reform in the face of incompetent, corrupt, and arbitrary rule. And in that context, the state proved utterly incapable of putting down those uprisings because its coercive apparatus fell apart. The, the regimes could not muster the soldiers. It could not pay the soldiers. It could not provide them with uh, arms sufficient to put down these popular uprisings in the early 90s. And so the regimes fell. Now, why was that? Because the, the, the whole region was suffering from that terrible debt crisis of the 80s that left these regimes economically bankrupt, and because it was a period at the beginning of the end of the Cold War. And so great power patrons, like the United States, were no longer willing to fit the bill that had sustained dem uh, dictators across the continent, as they had in the past, in the fight against communism. And so that's the, the collapse of the state is really why so many countries went democratic in sub-Saharan Africa. And that made a huge impression on me. Because of course, sub-Saharan Africa performed much more poorly on every structural front than the Middle East. But that was the one area where I suppose the Middle East was stronger. And so um, uh, the, the Middle East was in a l less strong position for opening. And so you get an opening. Um, anyway. The sub-Saharan African experience made me think why the Middle East and North Africa had been surpassed in the 90s. It was not because the cultural endowment in um, sub-Saharan African was more conducive to democratization. It was not. It was not because civil society was stronger in sub-Saharan Africa or the middle class was larger or literacy rates were higher. It was because in countries like Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the state had never lost its capacity to repress. And why was that? This was because of a number of exceptional conditions in the region. And for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to focus on two. First, many countries in the region, as you all know, have access to rents. Oil rents, gas rents, transit rents. That kept the state apparatus well funded. And so you had no state collapse in this region in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, as you did say in, in Africa. This fostered a robustness of authoritarianism in the region. And second, the region was exceptional in that the dictators in the Middle East and North Africa continued to have political utility to great powers like the United States even after the Cold War had ended. And this was rather unique to the region, right? In sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, once the Cold War ended in the late 1980s, most authoritarian dictatorships lost their political value to the great powers. And then the great powers began to pressure them to open up, to democratize. But this was not the case in the Middle East and North Africa. In the Middle East and North Africa, dictatorships continued to have value to great powers. And this is for three reasons. First, they guaranteed the delivery of precious commodities like oil and gas. Second, they provided assistance in combating the newest security threat posed now by Islamic radicalism and terror. And third, they provided assistance, some of them, like Egypt and Jordan, in the defense of one of the United States' core allies, uh, Israel. And so countries like Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, um, all enjoyed great power support at different crucial moments, even after the Cold War ended. So this was something quite exceptional to the region. 
So I would argue the exceptional persistence and strength of the state, and especially its coercive apparatus, to my mind, explains a good portion of the region's exceptional resistance to democratic transition in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. A second factor, somewhat related to the first, but also distinct, that expresses the re region's resistance to third wave transition in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. This focuses less on the state's capacity to repress democratic initiatives, maybe what I'd call the supply side of democracy, and focuses more on what I'd call the demand side of democracy. And this has to do with the more limited demand for democracy in some portions of the region, most notably in the Gulf countries. And this goes back to a very old argument, nothing original to me, made since the late 1970s, that the prevalence of oil and gas rents has enabled a not insignificant number of states in the region to buy off the public with all sorts of benefits and subsidized goods in return for not challenging the regime. This is the logic we associate with what's called the rentier model. I'm not going to rehearse it here. I think this logic only holds for about a third of the countries in the region, so it alone cannot explain the region-wide resistance to democratization, but it is one more factor exceptional to the region, and so I think it deserves mentioning. But now let me turn to a third factor that I think has made the region resistant to democracy, and frankly, this is the factor that I think that is most important today in the post-Arab Spring period. Um, to my mind, the biggest challenge to democratization in the Middle East and North Africa today, and again, this is a factor exceptional to the region, is the prevalent fear of utter chaos and insecurity that pervades the region today. This is a fear created by state collapse that we see in Syria and Libya, which threatens the security of all neighboring countries. This is a fear created by the spread of Islamic radicalism and terror. Nowhere in the world do we see such a pervasive sense of threat and insecurity. And this kills democratization. It kills democratization in two ways. First, it makes people dismiss the goal of, of the importance of democracy as a goal. Because people everywhere, in the Netherlands, in the United States, in the Middle East and North Africa, people everywhere prioritize security over freedom. Security, safety, that comes first. Freedom is a far lower priority. And so people are content to let the democratic objective slide if it means it's going to contribute to greater security. And we see this, for example, in Egypt. We see Egyptian people did this by the millions in June and July of 2013 when they called for the end of a democratically elected government and threw their support for, behind a military general who promoted, uh, promised them order and stability. Um, second, this popular prioritization of security over freedom gives repressive autocrats political cover to avoid further political opening. All the King of Jordan has to do is point to that chaos in neighboring Syria and immediately the middle class Democrats are silenced. So today I would argue that the exceptional conditions of insecurity in the region has led people to deprioritize democratization. And until that security situation is resolved, I don't think we're going to see much progress on the democratization front in the region. Now let me conclude with just a few words on where this analysis leaves us. For those of us who would like to see more democratization in the region, would like to encourage this process. First and foremost, I'm persuaded, as I'm sure many of you are, that democratization is primarily a homegrown phenomenon. Yes, you know, outsiders can help tinker at the margins, encouraging the process, retarding it a little bit. But in the end, democratization is driven and sustained by forces on the ground. Outsiders can only influence this process to a very small degree. The prospects for successful democratization are shaped to a not ins insignificant degree by large, slow-moving structural and institutional factors that are beyond the control of policymakers with a two or three or four year time horizon as most of our policymakers are. That said, having watched the divergent trajectories of Tunisia and Egypt in the wake of the Arab Spring, I, who was trained as a structuralist, a long-term 
committed structuralists when it comes to analyzing these sorts of um, trajectories. I came to be persuaded while watching Tunisia and Egypt of the radical indeterminacy, the radical structural indeterminacy of democratization. And I came to be persuaded by the crucially important role that individuals can play at certain critical junctures in political history. And that if you have the right people in the place, the right people in place at, time, at that time, people who are committed to the democratic process and values, people who are experienced and respected, people who are persuasive and credible, who have built networks of support through years of service and public engagement, those individuals can change the course of history and put a country on a democratic track. Because in the end, what is democratic transition? Democratic transition is just an institution building process that requires persuasion and deliberation and improvisation and consent. And to make that process happen, you need persuasive, committed, credible elites to drive it and to inspire other people to follow. Think of the role of Hossein Abbasi, the leader of the UGTT, the trade union movement in Tunisia, who by force of nature, by force of his own will, was able to push through national dialogue negotiations in the late 2013 and use his skill and his stamina to get a very divided people to agree to the compromises that were necessary to ratify a constitution. And that was a crucial step in moving the democratization process forward in Tunisia. Think of the role of Rashid Ranoushi, who was able to leverage his authority within the Nahda movement to eke out compromises, not easily, to eke out compromises on issues such as blasphemy, women's rights, the role of religion in the Tunisian constitution in order to win the trust of non-Islamists in Tunisian society. Crucial. Now by contrast, think of the role of Mohamed Morsi in Egypt who proved constitutionally incapable of reaching out beyond his Islamist constituency, who seemed intent on grabbing power, whether we are talking about the assembly he put together to write the constitution, or his decision to declare himself above constitutional review for a time uh, in the autumn of his uh, year in office, or his unwillingness to even provide rhetorical reassurance to the Coptic community that he would protect them from violence and discrimination. I mean, the contrast between these leaders, between Morsi and Ranoushi and Hossein Abbasi, could not be greater. And the decisions made by these leaders at critical junctures sent Egypt and Tunisia down very, very different paths. I mean, Tunisia could be an autocracy today. Egypt could be a democracy today. There's, none of this was carved in stone. So for me, the policy takeaway from this experience is this, the one wedge that we outsiders have, the one thing we can do to help the, along the process of democratization, and it's a small role, is we can help cult cultivate those spaces in civil society that nurture these sorts of leaders, that build people committed to compromise and collaborative rule and service, and that build credible histories of service in their societies and strong bases of support, networks of support, that then give them the credibility to be these leaders at the critical junctures. By doing this, we are cultivating the sorts of leaders who, if the skies part, if the structural conditions permit an opening in this moment of indeterminacy, they can seize that moment and point their country in a democratic direction. This is, to my mind, our only truly credible way we can help the process, small as it may be. And so I just say that this is what we should see as on going forward if we want to uh, foster future democratization in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva, for your enlightening presentation on the factors and actually also the individuals uh, which or who can contribute or possibly hinder lasting political transitions. It's my pleasure to now introduce our second speaker of the night, uh, Maha Yaya. Maha Yaya is, as of last week, the director of Carnegie's Middle East Center in Beirut, where her research focuses on citizenship, 
pluralism, and social justice in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. Among others, Maha is co-author of Promises of Spring, Citizenship and Civic Engagement in Democratic Transitions. Prior to joining Carnegie, Maha worked with the United Nations Development Program in Lebanon, where she was the director and principal author of the National Human Development Report 2008-2009. She has also worked with international organizations and in the private sector on projects related to development policies, cultural heritage, and post-conflict reconstruction in various countries in the Middle East. Maha, we're looking forward to your views and perspectives. You now have the floor. Please give Maha Yaya a warm applause. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Karen, for this introduction. And I just want to reiterate what Eva said about what a pleasure it is to be here with you today uh, and to speak at this particular forum, I think. Um, what I want to uh, present, I'm going to be showing a few, few slides as I. Oh, sorry, your glasses. <laughs> they don't quite change the slides. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with an anecdote, uh, and this is a, an, an exchange that I had with a taxi driver in Egypt in June 2013, and this was a few days before the presidential election. I had just arrived uh, to Egypt, and of course my first question is, what do you think of what's going on? So this uh, gentleman spent about 15 minutes blasting the military and talking about how he did not like what the military was doing. This is June 2013. So he was describing how he didn't like what the military was doing and did not appreciate their role. It went on for 15 minutes. So at the end of it, I said, well, then who are you going to vote for? We have a presidential you know, election coming up. And he turned around and looked at me and said, Sisi, of course. So, so I looked at him and I said, well, I, I don't quite understand. And he said, well, we, uh, today, the country is in a very difficult position, and Sisi is the only person who is able to influence the security services, who is able to, who has, who has command over the army, and can provide the kind of security that would foster economic growth and would foster the kind of stability that we need. And I said, well, what happens in four years if, like those that came before him, he refuses to leave? And his response was, well, we removed the first one, we removed the second one, and we will remove the third one as well. And that sort of, and in Arabic, it's just to emphasize it. So that was, for me, quite, a, it's a very telling anecdote or story. And there were many others like this in a lot of encounters, not only in Egypt, but across the region of the kind of sense of empowerment that people have in their own ability to make a difference and to uh, instigate change. Um, and this kind of ability is still very much there, part of the scene. Um, and I will come to that towards the middle of my talk. Um, but I think what's important here is the sense that, in this anecdote, that even though there might be a short-term understanding that we need to have security and stability for economic growth, we're not willing to compromise on the political freedoms um, that we went to the street to demand in 2011. Today, the Arab region is in flux. Uh, it is a place where everything is being questioned. The legitimacy of state institutions, be they governments or parliaments, business, private sector, religious institutions, labor unions, borders, identities, everything is in flux, everything is up for grabs, everything is being questioned. Um, it's also a region that is going through the kind of transformative change that we have not seen since World War I, the end of World War I, when the Ottoman Empire disintegrated and the region was carved up under the spheres of influence, particularly the British and the French. Um, today, Nine Arab countries are either witnessing civil conflict or some form of conflict. 136 million Arab citizens are living in countries experiencing this kind of conflict or foreign occupation. 
and around 27 million Arab citizens are displaced from their homes. Arabs make up 5% of the world's population, but account for more than 50% of its refugees. And if one is born an Arab, one is he or she is more, 30 times more likely to become a refugee than anyone else in the world. Um, out of this global refugee, these global migration shifts, we have 12 million Syrians. Um, I mean, that's where the weight of the refugee crisis has emerged. 12 million Syrians have been driven from their homes by barrel bombs and rampant killing. Globally, one in five refugees is Syrian and more than 50% of the population almost has forcibly moved from its home. Of the 12 million Syrians, about 4.5 million have moved to neighboring countries. There's 1.1 in Lebanon, there's another 800,000 in, 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 in Jordan, and then around 2 million in, uh, in Turkey. These numbers may have shifted more recently. Meanwhile, religious diversity is being dismantled. We saw this perhaps most prominently in Iraq. Uh, the Christ, uh, Christians, Esdis, Shabaks, Mandaeans, Shias, Turkmans were all driven from lands they had occupied for centuries in the Nineveh Valley. I'm talking about the aftermath of the establishment of Daesh, the Islamic, the so-called Islamic State. Uh, and that year that followed, um, 2.57 million people fled uh, homes they had occupied literally for, for centuries. And it's sort of, it's undermining perhaps one of the most critical uh, components of uh, what makes the, the region uh, and the Levant in particular unique in that way. Um, there are also stalled transitions. Eva talked a little bit about Egypt and what's been happening there, uh, Jordan and Morocco. Uh, these are places where we're seeing a tremendous regression, particularly in Egypt, but also in Jordan. We're seeing a tremendous regression in gains that happened post-2011. Uh, there's also territorial fragmentation, political fragmentation, and societal fragmentation. Uh, political parties are, you know, even those that have existed for a long time, are, are disintegrating before our eyes. I take the example of Tunisia. The only political party that has survived uh, intact to some extent is Nahda. Uh, whereas every other political party has splintered, has disappeared, has re-emerged in a different form. Um, there is a growing number of poor. Many of the refugees, uh, I mean, there's been a tremendous regression in development gains. In Yemen, for example, two-thirds of the population today are food insecure. Uh, in, 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 in Syria, 85% of the population is below the poverty line. These are numbers that hide behind them a very uh, compelling story. And they're numbers that can trap the region in a cycle of vulnerability if, it's there, if they're not addressed very quickly. Um, there's also the rise of non-militarized state actors, as we all very know. However, despite this gloom and doom scenario, I want to say that I do believe that the Arab Spring has not, has, is not ended, but actually has just started. Um, and I will explain why. Um, there are many theories of the Arab uprisings, uh, youth unemployment, modernization, middle class. I won't go into those, I mean, the different theories of, these, of the uprisings. But obviously, you know, what I would say is they were basically a revolt against an authoritarian bargain um, where uh, Arab citizens were asked to exchange their political rights for safety and security. When that bargain disintegrated, that social contract disintegrated, people took to the streets. Uh, in 2011, on the eve of the uprisings, actually on the eve of December 17, 2010, Arab citizens were facing multiple injustices that were reflective of the experience of citizenship in, uh, in Arab countries in the sense of who has the right to what and where. And it was apparent in a number of areas perhaps in three significant areas. One is uh, what we were witnessing across most Arab countries, and we can get into the particulars in the question and answer session, is growth without well-being. The benefits of macroeconomic growth uh, that was apparent in many different countries and that drove the UN, for example, to declare uh, Tunisia a success story in December 2010, or November 2010, I believe, 
um, the, the benefits of macroeconomic growth was distributed unevenly. Uh, as the state withdrew from the provision of state services and there was state capture uh, by a small percentage of the political elite. Uh, in Tunisia, for example, the ruling family. There was also liberalization without freedom. So unlike other parts of the world where there was economic liberalization was also accompanied with political liberalization, the Arab region did not witness, it, it actually witnessed an increase in repression, and there are many figures that indicate the increase in repression that accompanied economic liberalization, which led obviously to lives without dignity. So despite the tremendous strides in human development, we often forget that Arab governments over decades did invest in human development, did invest in education and in health, and we saw an improvement across all of these development integrations in most countries. So despite this improvement, the quality of life for many Arab citizens deteriorated significantly, and particularly for the middle class. Just one figure, 39 Arab, million Arabs suffered from multidimensional poverty, or actually, in what that means is they had, they were, they had, they faced serious deprivation, serious deprivations in health, education, and living conditions and living standards. How comes the first slide. Um, and beyond poverty, there was an uh, uh, inequality of opportunity. What you're looking at basically is looking at the percentage of children who'd never been to school. So there were, uh, there were clear uh, uh, inequalities in the ability of people to go to school between countries, i.e. Yemen versus Jordan. Um, but also within countries, rural versus urban, um, the ability to go to school depended not only on where you lived, but also who your parents were. Uh, and this created a lot of uh, discrimination within countries. Um, there was also a growth in the shadow economy, uh, unemployment, etc., so on and so forth. What this led was high levels of dissatisfaction. I'm sorry, I noticed that the... Um, Actually, this is visible. There were high levels of satisfaction. Just to get, give you a sense, all the dark colors are f more than 50% levels of dissatisfaction in a number of areas, including uh, standards of living, freedom in their life, educational systems. Here I was just looking at Egypt, Jordan, and Tunisia as a comparison. The ability of their children to learn and grow. So there were very high levels of dissatisfaction across many Arab countries. Um, there was a growing sense of injustice, uh, the sense that their standards of living were deteriorating uh, considerably. They were increasing, um, this, there was an increasing dissatisfaction with uh, predominant educational systems uh, across many countries, the sense that their children were not getting, were not being prepared for, a, uh, for a, you know, to achieve their potential in their current educational systems. Um, there was a sense that their children are actually doing worse. They weren't learning and growing in the way that they would be in other places around the world. Um, there was also increased perceptions of corruption uh, in government. Across most countries, the perception that corruption was increasing tremendously was very prevalent. There was also, not only in government, but also in the private sector, the sense that that was getting much, much worse. Whoops. Did I turn it off? Okay. Oh, here we are. Um, they were also dissatisfied with their freedom to choose, their ability to make their own choices. There was high levels of dissatisfaction across most of the countries. Um, what this meant was, and what I had talked about a little bit earlier, that already in 2010, there was a tremendous uh, loss of confidence in institutions across the board, whether it's major companies, political parties, civil service, labor unions, and so on and so forth. If we look at Tunisia, for example, the loss of confidence in political parties reached almost 80, actually almost 90% in 2010. Uh, whereas in uh, the loss of confidence in, uh, in government was almost 75%. And we see this also across a number of different countries. Yes. Um, so, what are the priorities that we see today? This is, uh, these, a couple of these slides are, were put for the benefit of Karen. These are, these are from the governance report that you cited. Um, the survey that we did on a number of, uh, on actually 101 uh, Arab uh, 
intellectuals, former policymakers, academics, uh, activists, so on and so forth. There's a program where you just throw in all the words that were, were, that were included in the survey in the responses, and the large words are the ones that, that featured the most in uh, respondents' uh, answers. And as you can see, corruption, government, political participation, citizens were the key issues. Um, 80 of them believe that representative democracy is uh, suitable for their region as a form of governance. Many of them blame the lack of political pluralism for the kind of the waves of extremism that we see today. Um, most of them ranked authoritarianism as the number one challenge for the region, followed by corruption and then followed by terrorism. As you can see, sectarianism is not showing up a lot here because sectarianism, even though it's become the prevalent lens through which the region is analyzed, from the region, it's governance. It's not sectarianism. Sectarianism is a byproduct of bad governance for many people in the region. Um, this is another poll. This is not the expert. This is a public opinion poll, which also shows the idea that people do, st do still want a democratic form of governance. But perhaps a caveat here. When we talk to people in terms of what does democracy mean to you? Or if you come to them and say, do you want a democratic form of governance? Many of them will say, democracy is doing nothing for me. Uh, if you talk to people in Tunisia today, they don't think that a democratic transition has really done much. They're, they're poorer than they were. They're doing worse than they were before. Um, the issue is that, um, but when you talk to them about their, their, the, 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 their rights and responsibilities, about the issue of freedoms, then they become very adamant. So I think when we talk about democracy, we need to be very careful about um, breaking it down and, under, and looking at what people see as democratic, what it is that they understand uh, a democratic system to be. Elections are shorthand, but it's so much more. Elections for us are the starting point of a political uh, and, and a democratic system uh, in many ways. Turn it off again. I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, so just to wrap up, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is... Uh, just to wrap up, uh, this is a graffiti. I think, in, um, to go back to my point, is why do I think that the Arab Spring has just started? Uh, I think there's been, uh, what this says is the revolution continues. And this is from Egypt, but you'll see similar ones across the region. Uh, in addition to the picture of gloom and doom, we're seeing remarkable initiatives taking place at the level of civil society across the board. We can talk a bit more about this. We're seeing debates happening. We're seeing questions. We're seeing forums. Uh, we're seeing music, theater. I mean, things that the, the, the Arab uprisings and the, cent the, the Arab uprisings lifted the lid. Uh, and the sense of empowerment that people have today is remarkable. And even though it's not making, it's only making the news when it's ISIS, uh, but actually it is very much there and in evidence across a number of initiatives that we can uh, also dis decide. Now, finally, just two words in terms of what can we do about it. I would say, yes, focus on Tunisia as paramount because we do need a, um, a success story. I think Tunisia, not only in terms of uh, political, uh, uh, in, in terms of nurturing the political transition, but actually helping Tunisians figure out a, an inclusive economic model that addresses inequities. Um, the issue of refugees, uh, I don't think a, uh, a political expediency and a political settlement uh, that is not based, that is not on, based on just, uh, that is not a just political settlement will work. It has to be a just political settlement. And we can, we can begin by talking, I mean, go beyond Assad. Maintaining Assad, I think, will be a, a lethal mistake. But go beyond Assad and start talking about the kind of governance system. What are the powers that need to remain with the presidency? What are the things that need to be devolved? Uh, what kind of things can we start looking at? Uh, give civil society a forum. Watch for the wild cards, which I think Iyad will be talking a little bit more about. That is uh, KSA in Algeria. Uh, and perhaps refocus on the Palestine-Israeli issue, because that is an important one still in the region. Thank you.
Thank you, Maha, and, and, and thank you also for presenting not only a picture of gloom and doom, as you called it yourself, but also emphasizing what is actually happening in the region, the positive initiatives, the vibrancy, um, and I personally believe that we in the Netherlands perhaps don't really hear enough about that, and that's indeed, as you also indicated, mostly not covered because media tend to focus on the more violent um, um, things happening in the region. So thank you very much. And um, our third speaker of tonight, whom I would now like to introduce, is um, Iyad, Iyad el-Baghdadi. Um, Iyad el-Baghdadi is an author, human rights activist, entrepreneur, and an avid social media user. He came to prominence because of his online activism, mainly through blogs and tweets during the Arab uprisings, which led to his imprisonment and ultimately banishment from the United Arab Emirates in 2014. Iyad is a stateless Palestinian who has received political asylum in Norway. He is currently working on the Arab Spring Manifesto, in which he will present his vision for the future of the Arab world post-Arab uprisings, and on publishing what is called the Arab Tyrants Manual, an ironic manual for Arab autocrats. Iyad currently has 78,000 followers on Twitter, and perhaps a few more after tonight. Iyad, you'll have the floor. Please give Iyad a warm applause. Thank you, Karen. There's a certain tension between, between analysts and entrepreneurs. It's okay, it's okay. Thank you. There's this certain tension between analysts and entrepreneurs. Analysts are focused on describing the world as accurately and as precisely as possible while entrepreneurs are focused on changing it. I'm today given the task to be the entrepreneur talking after two analysts, amazing analysts, I must say. Uh, so I stand before you today as an intellectual entrepreneur. In my presentation today, I hope to shift, or to help to shift the discussion from the problem domain to the solution domain. So a couple of days before flying to Amsterdam from Oslo, I was sent a brief uh, advisory uh, uh, prepared by the Advisory Council on International Affairs about the prospects for the region. Uh, needless to say, it was quite dismal. Uh, when you look at the Arab region today, there's plenty of reasons to be depressed. A region that showed so much promise five years ago has become an open wound. And that wound has become infected. Europe is feeling the pain too. And unfortunately, the political window uh, seems, at least here in Europe, focused on unsustainable short-term thinking. Uh, I do not see a strategy. I see tactical moves driven by political expediency. So a strategy requires a goal. Uh, and I think, I think from, from today's topic, democratization, it seems that there's a general agreement that it is democracy which is the path to peace and prosperity and stability in the Arab region. I do not disagree, uh, but I think we need to qualify the statement. Democracy alone is not a solution. There needs to be, there is a kind of democracy which is sustainable and stable and has a proven track record in bringing peace and stability, and that's a liberal democracy. But there is yet another kind of democracy which is unsustainable, which is an illiberal democracy. So allow me to zoom out before refocusing on the Arab region. Uh, the mid-1990s must have been an exciting time for democracy enthusiasts. I mean, I wouldn't know I was a teenager back then. The number of countries classified as participatory democracies was on the rise. But as you can see, progress stalled from there. In the midst of the euphoria in 1997, Farid Zakaria wrote a, uh, a paper predicting uh, the rise of illiberal democracy. He was one of the first people to uh, point to the phenomenon. He was talking about democracy spreading into areas of the world that lacked a liberal intellectual tradition. Uh, at the time, he was talking about the former Yugoslavia, uh, parts of Latin America, the Palestinian Authority, 
parts of Africa, but today this is most pronounced perhaps in two large countries, Turkey and India. So for, for years now, I've read the, the rise of right-wing populism and the rise of Muslim radicalization as one broad phenomenon. Uh, it's, it's basically at the basis of this is a rejection of fundamental equality, a rejection or a departure from liberalism. Last month, I had the chance to discuss this with two dear friends uh, and brilliant commentators, Mustafa Akul from Turkey and Bobby Ghosh from India. By the way, that's not them. <laughs> The story seemed very similar, uh, a combination of economic reform and uh, democracy has lifted millions of people who were previously outside the political system into the middle class uh, and into the political system. The problem is that they were politically activated, but they were never liberalized. In the case of India, for example, a liberal tradition existed, but it never penetrated beyond a narrow elite. Uh, I'm talking about 1960s and 1970s. Today, masses of people who were not participa participating in democracy before are now active voters. They aren't liberal, however. Ironically enough, the rise of illiberal democracy in many key countries is the result of democracy working. People are being, uh, are, are being added into the political system. What's the problem, however? Isn't a liberal democracy better than no democracy? I mean, won't an illiberal democracy liberalize over time? So while democracy, any democracy is a good start. I mean, uh, uh, Eva mentioned uh, the, the idea that democracy, I mean, you know, d d uh, a liberal tradition is not a, uh, a prerequisite for, uh, for uh, democracy. And, you know, a participa participatory democracy is a good start. And I do not disagree. Uh, it's not about transition, it's about sustainability. Uh, in 2014, Larry Diamond wrote a paper called Is Democracy in Decline? Uh, in which he noted the mechanisms for how an illiberal democracy stops being a democracy altogether. Three things he noted. First, the executive branch inflates and becomes authoritarian. Second, opposition rights are trampled, which reduces pluralism. Third, free speech is shut down. Under one guise or another. This is how you destroy a democracy. All of this is done legally. This is how you destroy a democracy from within via the ballot box, by law. Illiberal democracy is not sustainable. For democracy to be sustained and to prosper, it needs to be supported by a liberal political culture. It needs to be fed continuously by a liberal intellectual tradition. Democracy is the mechanism. Liberalism is the idea. Democracy is the hardware. Liberalism is the software. So what does it take to have a liberal intellectual uh, tradition? I mean, let me zoom back to the Arab region. What's the Arabic word for liberalism? So we have, in the Arabic language, we don't have a problem indigenizing words. For example, the web, we call it al-shabaka. We, we managed to find a word for it. Uh, we, we have smartphones, we call it, we call it hat of jawal. We have computers, we call it hasub. But a hundred years later, we still call libera liberalism liberalia. We transliterate it. We have not indigenized it. We simply transliterated it. Why is that a problem? Because there's a cultural distance to cross. For many decades, liberalism, be it in Turkey or in India or in the Arab world, was never indigenized. It was always a foreign concept. It was, uh, it was imposed by others, by out, by either by an elite or, or, or by outsiders. It was the ideology of the powerful other, often of the colonizer. For this reason, it never penetrated below a narrow elite. It never reached the everyman. It was never presented in his cultural language. The lack of an indigenous Arab and Muslim liberal tradition is among the key hurdles to democratization, sustainable democratization. In order to have a sustainable liberal tradition, we need to indigenize liberty. We need to start talking about it in our cultural language, in our, in our own terms. Islam in the region is not just a theology, it's not just a religion, it's an identity. 
You cannot expect people to shed their identity to win them over. You need to speak to them within their identity and in their cultural language. There might be some skepticism here and, you know, creating an indigenous liberal tradition seems like hard work. It is hard work, but the good news is that we're not starting from scratch. An Islamic liberal tradition is not only possible, not only eminently possible, it already exists. So when did Turkey decriminalize homosexuality? It's a trick question. Because when Turkey decriminalized homosexuality, it was the Ottoman Empire, it was still, it was still the Ottoman Empire. In contrast, colonial Britain made homosexuality a crime in, in 1861 in, in, uh, in India. Tunisia abolished slavery a whole 17 years before Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. During the 19th century and in the early 20th century, a liberal native reform movement developed in the Islamic world. It questioned traditional structures and produced an invaluable intellectual output. Uh, in the Arab world, we call this the Nahda movement. And it represented what I like to call a civilizational soul searching. The region was opening its eyes and trying to chart a path. Unfortunately, the Nahda and its indigenization project were cruelly interrupted, first by colonialism in the early 20th century, then by three or four generations of tyranny. Tyranny puts a break on ideas. It shuts down intellectual progress. Uh, it shortens the menu of ideas uh, available to native people. The rise of extremist, ex extremist ideologies as a side effect of a very short menu of ideas. This long interruption has definitely had its toll. Illiberalism today is rife in the Arab region. Even if we accept that the creation of an Islamic liberal tradition is possible, it still looks like hard work. Here's the good news. In Arab modern history, and perhaps in the entirety of modern Ar Arab history, there has never been a better time to shift ideas. This is the best time in probably a thousand years or even more to shift ideas in the Arab world. And there are five drivers to this, which I'm tr I'll try to run through very quickly. First, this is the most literal generation of Arabs ever. The most literate generations ever. Much of the change has happened in the span of a single generation, as you can see. Uh, since 2011, the trend has not slowed down, it's accelerated. Uh, as you can see, Arab young people, uh, their literacy rate is around 93%. Arab seniors is around 30%. Uh, second, this is the most highly connected generation of Arabs ever in history. Not only can a vast majority of Arabs read and write, they, can, they have access to a wider range of ideas and opinions than any generation that preceded them. Since 2011, this trend has not slowed down, it has accelerated. Third, and this is an important point, uh, this is probably the most irreverent and creative and cheeky Arab generation ever. Uh, I mean, irreverence is often seen as impolite or disrespectful, uh, and sometimes it is, but I think, I think uh, it really talks about, it really talks about people's willingness to question everything. Just like Maha said earlier today, people are questioning everything. Irreverence is a, is a positive attitude in this kind of situation. The attitude of many young Arabs towards authority, be it the authority of the state, be it the authority of the clerical establishment, being the authority of social norms, the aut automatic respect and obedience is, is, is being threatened very, very, uh, like, like never before. This is an example from Egypt where uh, Egyptians put up CC on eBay for sale. This is a meme that was created when uh, the Saudi royal visited Egypt. This is an example from Saudi Arabia uh, I think it takes an Arab to understand it. <laughs> but here's the, the, the point here is that there has never been a better time to shift ideas in the Arab world. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to move on to the flip side, the price of failure. This is Zatari camp in Jordan. I started my presentation by pointing to a general lack of strategy and, and, and a tendency to rely on short-term technical moves. And I'm sorry if I'm being harsh, but when I hear of proposals to build refugee camps in Egypt and Sudan and Libya uh, to deport refugees back to, 
when I hear of a proposal to work with Assad in Syria in the fantasy that it will defeat terrorism, this is what comes to mind. There's no strategic thinking. Europe cannot afford to continue to manage a collapsing Arab world. It is too big to be managed. Maha cited some really astounding statistics. Everything that we see right now can be just the beginning of a collapse. Just the beginning. To continue with unsustainable short-term fixes, often amoral ones, in the name of pragmatism, is far too expensive. Democracy, liberal democracy, is the best path to peace, prosperity, and stability in the Middle East. We are at a crossroads. We can continue to do more of the same at immense cost and eventual failure, or we can do the hard work. There's no way, there is no way around it. This is the worst time to disengage and lose hope. The Arab world is in the midst of an intergenerational shift, of which the Arab uprising in 2011 were only a, sim a symptom or a consequence. Beneath the daily disasters, there is something fresh and green trying to push through. The flowering of that is hope. The Arab Spring is not the problem, it's the solution. Let me summarize. There can be no stable Europe without a stable Arab world. There can, be no sustainable, can, there can be no sustainably stable Arab world without democracy, justice, and human rights. There can be no sustainably stable democracy in the Arab world unless it is a liberal democracy. There can be no liberal democracy in the Arab world unless liber, liber, liberalism or liberty is indigenized. There's never, ever been a better time to shift ideas in the Arab world, and there's never been a more urgent time to. The central work that needs to be done is intellectual work that requires intellectual entrepreneurship. And an Islamic liberal tradition needs to be put into a framework, into a modern ideology, which can steal the congregation from authoritarians, be they Islamist or nationalist, or otherwise. In an atmosphere of freedom, ideas can march very quickly. I get messages like these all the time in both Arabic and English. And it's always the same story. People who were following tradition for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and then suddenly 2011 hits, they're exposed to a flood of new ideas, and things start to change. So guess in which year these statements were made on Arabic? Which year? Anyone? This was in 1900, 1900. I said earlier that I stand before you as an intellectual entrepreneur. People know me as the Twitter guy. Uh, but what many of you don't know is that I'm a 15 year business veteran. Uh, I'm a career entrepreneur. My primary expertise is in project management and organizational development. And I also hold three black belts in different martial arts. And uh, I, don't, I no longer have the, the body of a martial artist, but I still have the mind of one. And it is with this background that I claim to stand you bef before you today as an intellectual entrepreneur. And it is with this background that I wish to take this opportunity to announce our think tank, the Kawakibi Foundation for Islamic Libertarianism. Our mission is, as expected, the indigenization of liberty in the Arab and Muslim world. Our work intersects radicalization, right-wing populism, civic nationalism, and is carried out via original research, popularization, uh, capacity building, outreach, and community, man community engagement. However, we also recognize that this is too big a task for a single mind, or a single team, or a single organization. This is why we would like to work to organize uh, Arab thinkers, activists, social entrepreneurs, dissenters, change makers, into an Arab Freedom Forum. The change that we would like to see happening is best summarized as expanding the menu of ideas in the Arab world. There has never been a better time to do this or a more urgent time. So before closing, I feel like I have a duty to let you know what are the most serious hurdles that lay ahead of our project, the project to indigenize liberty. There are, of course, intellectual opponents. There are those who will claim that our task is not possible. There are those who will claim that it's unnecessary. There are those who, in the name of cultural relativism, end up with the bigotry of low expectations. And there are others who, in the name of muscular liberalism, 
end up causing more good, more harm than good. But the main enemy, the number one unambiguous enemy, is the dictatorships that completely shut down international, internal reform. And shut down and, and the policies that empower these dictators. As desperately as the region needs native reform, no such reform can proceed in stifling tyranny. Between 2013 and 2014, the native reformers who represented the Arab Spring were hit with a sledgehammer. Some of us were killed. Some of us were tortured. Some of us were jailed. Some of us were silenced. And some of us, like me, ended up in exile. My own story is a case in point. I was born and raised in the Arab world, specifically in the United Arab Emirates, until in the aftermath of the counter-revolutions, I was summarily jailed, expelled, and forcibly exiled from the Arab region. My life and that of my family were upturned, and it's taken two years for things to start to fall into place. The first step, the very first step to native reform is to protect native reformers. They're doing the work that needs to be done under great duress, under great personal risk. The future of the region, the future of the world, depends upon their success. If free speech and civil society are protected, our societies can take care of themselves. If they are not, our societies will remain stunted, weak, and ripe for disaster. An easy prey for radicalization and authoritarian ideologies. If you want to root for us, then please do not empower our persecutors. You cannot continue to let down Arab reformers and then wonder why there's no reform in the Arab world. I got this from I got this quote from an early 1970s lecture by Viktor Frankl, quoting Goethe. And I believe it applies to societies as much as it applies to people. We need to stop the self-defeating and self-fulfilling decimal projection about the region and start believing in its own native reformers. In 2011, an old order was broken, but a new one has not arrived. Gramsci called this a time of monsters. We cannot sidestep this phase. We cannot jump over it. We cannot crawl under it. We have to go through it. This is an intergenerational responsibility and it's a historical task. And we need Europe's support because we share a destiny. The way forward requires you to disbelieve in the Arab and Shan regime, but to believe again in the dynamism of Arab societies and to support its native reformers. Thank you. Thank you, Iyad. Uh, thank you very much for sharing some of your personal experiences and also for um, not just giving an assessment of the problem but also providing directions for a solution. Um, also, I think I thought that your uh, analysis of democracy being the hardware and um, liberalization the software was, uh, was pretty innovating and I think what we hear here is also the words of an entrepreneur who also does computer programming work to some extent. Um, well, We've heard three excellent presentations on the subject, I believe, and um, some for, I think for us some, some, some uh, sounds that we don't hear, hear too often. Uh, the Arab Spring's only just begun. Uh, the Arab Spring is not uh, the problem but the solution of the current situation. I'm sure it has provided all of you uh, with a lot of food for thought. And um, I, um, I would now like to open the floor for questions uh, from, from the audience. Um, I would like to um, ask if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, and if you get the microphone, um, please introduce yourself and ask one question at a time. Uh, try to be brief and uh, try to keep in mind, uh, as I also said last time, that a question does end with a question mark. Um, we'll, We'll take three questions uh, at the time. So, whom can I give the floor as first speaker, sir? Yes, yes. Could you identify yourself first, sir? Well, thank you, Thanks. thank you for the panel, and thank you for organizing this. I'm the ambassador of Saudi Arabia here in the Netherlands. Well, I don't know how much time I will be given to comment a little bit, but I'll make it so short, I'll have a question. We had in the region an election in 2005, and Hamas won in Gaza and, and, and Palestine, 
and uh, imagine what happened then. I need an answer for that. Who killed that democracy? Uh, and in 1991, another election held in Algeria uh, uh, with a free election. And who killed that election too? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I would like to take a number of questions at the same time. I see someone in the audience over there. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is for Professor Berlin, and I want to ask her, how do you assess the democratization of Kuwait? Because it is a very special case in the Middle East, and it has a strong American involvement. So are you pleased with what your colleagues uh, have achieved there? Thank you. One more question. Uh, please, here in front, there is a gentleman who would like to have a microphone. Yes. Thank you. I'm the ambassador of Egypt. Uh, my question is uh, to uh, Professor Balin. Uh, it seems to me that when you presented uh, the, your presentation, your basic premise is Tunisia succeeded, Egypt failed. Now, what do you base your uh, evaluation on that, especially that we've had a referendum, a referendum to elections, a vibrant parliament, uh, uh, and uh, I must say also um, a freedom of speech, just the, the, the demonstrated uh, tweet, or uh, was it on Facebook, uh, indicates how open that the Egyptians are in expressing their points of view. So on what basis do you, did you reach that conclusion? Thank you. Thank for your, thanks for your question. Uh, we now have three questions on the table. Um, what happened with democracy as regards to Hamas and Algeria? I'm not sure if either one of you would like to take that question. And then there were two questions. I think they were addressed to you, Eva. Um, one about democratization in Kuwait, and uh, the other one about comparing Tunisia and Egypt, and what was the basis for your research. Um, would you um, be able to take sure. either one of those? Well, I'll start with the one I, can, I, I feel most competent to speak about, and that is the question raised by the Egyptian ambassador. Um, and I should tell you, I, I love Egypt. <laughs> and I spend more time in Egypt than any other country. So this is said out of a sense of, 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 of love and, and sadness, not distant critique. Um, you know, the, the, the classic definition of successful transition, it's very straightforward. You have to have two elections with alternation of power. And we don't have that in Egypt, right? You have not seen an alternation in power with two, two free and fair elections. Um, and uh, also, you need to see certain basic civil liberties respected. And um, you know, the fact that I don't have the numbers, I'm sure um, Maha knows this better than I, but the number of journalists that have been arrested in Egypt today, uh, the, the, the control over the newspapers, we just heard that uh, now the president has seized control over ed assigning the editors of all the major newspapers. Um, I mean, no, you, you can't argue that there's freedom of speech in Egypt today, which seems so shocking to me after about 10 or 15 years where it seemed like things were really opening up. It's, it's, it seems Could you much... Speak up, please? It's not oh, I'm sorry. Is this not working? I think it's working. But maybe I'm just... Okay. Could, speak maybe more clearly. Speak anyway, I just... Possible. Okay. I think um, there's a great deal of room for improvement in civil liberties. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that things will change in Egypt, but it is... It's hard to say that Egypt is in a good place politically right now. Um, in terms of the question of um, what is happening in Kuwait, <laughs> so this is almost my nightmare, you know. There, there, there are 22 Arab countries and Turkey and, each, and, um, and Israel, which I'm expected to stay up on, which I can't possibly do. And so I, long ago I said, I'm going to hand over the Gulf some, I have a couple of colleagues. You'd be responsible for the Gulf. So I hardly keep up on what's happening in Kuwait. Oh my God, this is going to be now on the internet. <laughs> it will follow me for the rest of my life. So I am going to defer, perhaps to Iyad, who's from the Gulf, to say something about the quality of democracy in, in Kuwait. Please. Yeah, well, I'm, like I'm, not, I'm not completely apprised on everyday Kuwaiti affairs, but it seems to me that Kuwait has uh, unfortunately become a cautionary, cautionary tale for other uh, Gulf countries mainly because of the level, I mean, uh, 
I, I was actually following, this is, I'm, I'm, I don't really follow it very closely, but it seems that there was a dispute in Parliament a few days ago, and there was a hashtag about one parliamentarian hitting another parliamentarian with a shoe. <laughs> and people were actually disputing whether it was a shoe or whether it was a slipper. <laughs> uh, the point here is that this, is, this, is, this, is, this brings me back to the point. Without, uh, sometimes we just look at the trappings of democracy and we don't look at what, what, needs, what it needs to be running. Uh, it's, it re re we really need a public sphere, a vibrant public sphere, a healthy public sphere. Uh, unfortunately, in Kuwait, uh, first of all, there is an executive overreach. Uh, the average citizen is uh, politically in, uh, engaged, but young people are increasingly uh, looking outside the system. Uh, there were mass protests in 2012 and 2013. Uh, and at least the, the, way that the, the way that this looks from other Gulf countries is that, do you really want a democracy? Look at Kuwait, unfortunately. I'm sorry that I cannot comment more, but I'm not completely apprised on the situation. Thank you, Iyad. Um, um, and then we had a question from the ambassador of uh, Saudi Arabia on, on, on Hamas and Algeria. Would you like to comment on that, Iyad? I mean, or per Mahat? perhaps the ambassador can explain what he means. I mean, yes, those are both very sad stories, but where, where, where do you place the responsibility and how does that challenge things that we have said? But perhaps the microphone can go we to the ambassador. We had this free election at that time, in 1991 um, in Algeria and then 2006, early 2006 in, 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 in Palestine. And uh, that was, you know, some people considered it was a free election. But unfortunately, some players internationally and regionally did not, were not happy with that election. And uh, you know what happened to that election? They, they were overturned and uh, uh, simply killed. I mean, the, the process of democracy then, did not move on uh, on, the, on the way that was expected. Right, but in Algeria, the, what killed democracy was the military. The military ended the second election, and so it, we can't say that was a, a normal playing out of democratization, correct? So I, I don't... Okay. Maybe we should also move on to some we other haven't, questions. We haven't, we haven't seen any reaction for, from the pro-democracy, like in the West here. Oh. Would, would any of you, Ma, would you like to comment on this uh, specific topic before we move on to the next round of questions from, from other people in the audience? I'll, if you want to move around, I'd like, yeah, to, we'll, I'd like to come back to Egypt, we'll, but if we can move around. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll move around and perhaps we'll come back also to this specific topic. Um, are there any other people in the audience? Can I uh, invite the people who are sitting uh, upstairs to come downstairs if they'd like to ask a question so we could um, hand them the microphone. So please come, come down if you have a question. Um, are there any more questions in the audience? I see a lady over there, I believe. <laughs> Hello, my name is Joshua. I'd really like to thank you all three for your perspective on the Middle East for tonight. Uh, my question is also for Eva Bellin, um, because you said that the, the small role that we in the West might have is enhancing the openings in civil society. Uh, but on the other hand, you pointed out that security is mostly, mostly the priority above democratization. And I'm wondering, do you see a role for the West in bringing security or enhancing security by military involvement, and if so, how? Thanks for your question. And I see a gentleman over there, I believe, Simon. Um, would you want me to answer that? No, we'll take three questions at a time, and then we'll come back to them. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Hans Bolscher. Um, follow up on that question on the role of the Western democracies. It was Western democracies who supported the dictators. It was Western democracies who created the biggest part of the chaos at the moment. How do you look at the role, also not in helping, but also in causing? I mean, we are democracy, but apparently we're not perfect either. Thanks for this question. Any more questions, perhaps? Uh, the, the lady, yes, over there. Yes, please. My name is Yasmin Jawad. I'm a social Arab uh, researcher. Uh, could you speak? I'm sorry, because you speak up a little bit. Because it's hard I'm to hear having you. cold. Sorry, that's yeah, why. Yeah, that's the, right. Okay. Um, my name is Yasmin Jawad. I'm a social Arab uh, researcher, originally from Iraq. I have missed 
name of Iraq among all the countries you mentioned. And Iraq at the moment is a, a theocratic sectarian government with militias instead of the national army. And the blame still from the majority now of the Iraqi people who are suffering for the last 12, uh, 14 years, this is the American democracy. So my question is, from the 17th century, Europe is defending its democracy and secularist governments. How comes that Iraqi government, which is a secular sectarian government, is recognized internationally and backed militarily by the Western world? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your question. Well, I think we've got three questions on the table here uh, that are all very much related also to the role of the West. Western players in the United States and Europe vis-a-vis -vis countries in the Middle East. And um, perhaps I could first invite Maha to address a number of questions, including also a previous question we had on, on Egypt. I also speak out of love for Egypt. Let me start with that. But I am very concerned about Egypt. And I think Egypt, we should all be very concerned. I see Egypt today as a ticking time bomb on many fronts. And yes, the level of repression that is happening, unfortunately, is, is considerable. Um, and even though there's this change of mood, there is a, there's no going back to prior to 2011. And yet, what we're seeing in terms of what's happening for, to journalists, to civil society activists, uh, to Islamists, to every single sector um, and multiple sectors, for me is very frightening. And I worry about Egypt, not only because it's the most populous country in the region, but because it also has a tremendously vi vibrant society, and it has tremendous potential, and yet that potential is not being realized. We can talk a bit more, and what I'm very concerned about is actually we're gonna see increase in violence, uh, and people turning towards uh, more violence in reaction to uh, their inability to express themselves in anywhere, basically. Um, so we can we can talk a little bit more about this if you like in the in the reception. But I am concerned. I'm very concerned about the, a country that I very much uh, care for, uh, and because I see also, I mean, the unraveling of Egypt, if it ever comes to that, unfortunately, will have tremendous impact on on the the, the ricochet and the ripple effect will have tremendous impact. Uh, in terms of Iraq, uh, I'm not quite certain how to answer your question because I don't think that, uh, I mean, that countries are recognized and governments are recognized uh, when they're elected in their own system. But I think in, the, in, in, in Iraq itself, it's undergoing a tremendous transition. I mentioned just very quickly what had happened in the post-ISIS uh, situation, but um, there have been massive demonstrations on the street in Iraq. Uh, for the past year, there's a lot of challenges that are happening by civil society, by civil society actually. Uh, the unfortunate part that this is happening within uh, the sectarian blocks, if you want. So the protests that we're seeing in Baghdad are challenging the Iraqi government, the Baghdadi government. For people in other parts of Iraq, they see it as a Shia uh, protest. There are protests happening in uh, the Kurdish areas in Kurdistan, um, but they're also challenging Kurdish leadership. Uh, so it's a very fragmented uh, set of challenges um, that are going on, but I'm, I'm not quite certain how to engage with why do, does the West uh, uh, acknowledge, sorry, there you are, why the West actually acknowledges or engages with the government. The government was elected uh, in what were deemed as free and fair elections across the board. We can, we can engage, I mean, we can discuss with this. What I'm more concerned about is what kind of support uh, can be provided to the government uh, to allow it to embrace all its population. The big concern today in Iraq is that uh, you know everybody's talking about the fight against ISIS, but nobody's asking the question of what next after ISIS. What happens when ISIS is defeated and it will be defeated? What happens then? Who's going to control? People are terrified. There are areas that have been recaptured where people have not gone back to their homes because they don't feel safe. 
And we're going to see the same scenario in Syria. So I think these are very important questions to ask, and perhaps better ask in terms of how can we provide and what kind of support is needed. Uh, how do you penalize al hajj al-Shabi that is committing in certain areas uh, massacres? I mean, it's so. Thank you, Maha. Um, Eva, would you like to comment on the question that um, I think came from the lady over there regarding security, democracy? How do we address that? And then afterwards, Iyad. Yeah, Actually, to... this will speak to three of the questions that were sure. raised. It's this general question of, of Western intervention, whether for security or for democracy or um, uh, humanitarian assistance. And this is something that I really struggle with, and we were discussing it as a group even just today. Um, you know, Western intervention in all these areas has proven to be not terribly successful and not terribly welcome by the people that we believed we were helping or defending. And that has led to a real retreat in, um, in our, at least, Amer I can speak as an American, in America's willingness to intervene. It has spelled more modesty in our foreign policy. That is how you might describe uh, Barack Obama's policy. And that has been true even in the area of humanitarian intervention. There, there's no will to be ambitious anymore. And um, I'm not sure this is wrong. You know, this is something I really struggle with about what is our moral responsibility. We as a great power, I say, uh, in terms of intervention, if again, we are rarely successful and our efforts are rarely welcome. And I really open that up. I don't know what the answer is. But if you, you know, there's the saying, and I can't remember the Latin, but um, for we, we teach our uh, medical students, your first obligation is first do no harm. And so if you're not sure you can do something good, then first do no harm. Maybe you should just be modest and hold back. And I, I am of having seen so much failure in the last 20 years, that's certainly my disposition. But I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eva. Um, Iyad, would you like to comment? Well, uh, forgive me, but I have to go back to the question of Egypt again. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we, we have, I mean, there is a saying in Egypt that Egypt, Egyptians call Egypt the mother of the world, Umm dunya And I'd like to say that an Arab who doesn't, like, doesn't love Egypt is an ungrateful son. Al Arab ili mayhabbish Masr ibn Aq. Uh, there is a reason why we are so concerned. Uh, it's, it's that Egypt is very, very important. Egypt represents 40% of, of, of all Arabs. Uh, the demographic weight uh, is, is enormous. There is no healthy Arab order without a healthy Egypt. And this is why we have to keep coming back to Egypt and raise concerns because things are very worrying. Uh, but I think, Karen, maybe, maybe it's time to take another round of... Uh, yeah, I was yeah. just wondering about that because I think we have maybe 10 more minutes. So if there are a number of more questions, I will take three more. Um, I think the gentleman over there has been standing there for a while, so... Yes. Oh, I see many hands raised now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, all speakers, uh, for your uh, thing. Um, my name is Edo Fedoner. Um, Iyad, what really inspired me about your speech is that you, uh, your entrepreneurial um, attitude towards uh, democratization, and you spoke about uh, the liberalization that you would like to see in the Arab world. Uh, now, I have read that um, because of the, the whole rationalism and enlightenment wave did not pass through the Arab world, uh, in fact, there is a breed of Orientalism uh, which, which starts around the border of Turkey, which prevents uh, that type of enlightenment or, or liberalism. And you say, well, we should uh, speak within the identity of Islam or, or uh, the identity of the Arab Islam in order to, to, uh, to prosper and to feed it. Uh, yet, it seems to me very difficult to do that from outside, uh, I mean, who are they to accept our uh, intervention, but also from the inside. And I would like to hear a little bit more about the instruments you yourself would like to use uh, and the instruments you would like others to use to see that enlightenment in the Arab world. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe I see a young lady over there. If we could pass the mic.
Um, I was wondering all the different uh, Islamic branches of all the different, uh, like the Sunnis and the Shiites, and the, I can imagine that talking about uh, liberacy and security and democracy, that's also what's needed to unite or to create a respect in order to bring security in the region for people. Thank you for your concise question. I think we have time for one more question. Um, yes, the gentleman over there has been waiting for a while. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Herman Kleinsma. I'm the chairman of the Dutch-Libyan Cooperation Council. Uh, since a couple of months, I have been involved in trying to put together with many of my Libyan friends um, to put together a, a think tank of predominantly Libyan experts on how to solve the huge problems we now uh, face in Libya. Um, many of the Libyans I meet, they try to convince me that, and I, want, I would like to have your opinion on that, that it is absolutely impossible to build a liberal democracy in Libya or in any other Arab country if and when Muslim brothers and related groups are being involved in the process of we, trying to build democracy. Excuse me, we, but we still have little time left. So yeah, but you, so what is your opinion? Your is it yes or no possible to build a democracy, a true democracy, for example in Libya, if the Muslim brothers and related organizations are included in that process? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've got three more questions. One about uh, Islamic enlightenment. Is there? It's very eager. Uh, it's very eager. Okay. okay. One more question. We'll take one more question if it's very short and concise. Is this our last round? The, yeah, okay. this is the thank last. Thank you round. very much. Um, first of all, thank you for the Foreign Office to invite uh, Eva Bellen and uh, Mahia and um, Maha Yahya and uh, Iyad here because it's wonderful to have them here after having read all their works for the past years. My name is Ruhl Meyer. I'm, uh, I've been working on citizenship and the concept of citizenship in the Middle East. And I was wondering what you think about uh, the idea. Um, uh, because I, I think also if, if you look at uh, Ava Bellin's uh, uh, story about uh, Tunisia, you see that one of the reasons why al Nahda and Marzuki and these others were able to make a compromise was based on the idea of citizenship uh, in Paris in 2004, I think. Uh, so I was wondering, is it not just the state, but it's also the way coalitions are made in the Middle East, especially between Islamist and secular movements, which is crucial for ideas of uh, solving uh, the major problems. And also, I know that uh, Maha Yahya has written a book on citizenship, and I was wondering how citizenship would figure in uh, the future of the Middle East. And, and coming to uh, Iyad. It was supposed to be one question. So. Uh, but there, it's <laughs> just the same question for all three. <laughs> for Iyad, uh, also your, your idea of liberalism. Of course, in the, in the Middle East, one of the problems is there are liberals which are not de Democrats, and there are Democrats which are not liberals. Citizenship would be a way to bring them together. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's focus on the concept of citizenship for a moment. And we also had a few other questions on the table, but I leave it up to you to which one you would like to respond. Perhaps well, I'm, I could I'm first of, give I'm the floor to I'm kind of starting Iyad. to lose my voice. So I think maybe I'll, I'll take the first round and then I'll pass it to you, Mah uh, Maha. Okay. Uh, so there was a question addressed to me about the, the rationalism and the enlightenment and uh, how basically it skipped the region. The fact is that, that that's actually not true. Uh, we had in the Islamic world a reverse enlightenment. We actually had uh, uh, a very strong uh, rationalistic tradition, but we lost it. Uh, if, we, if you actually chart the number of empirical scientists, just the empirical uh, scientists working in the Islamic world, and I'm starting from, I'm talking in Hijri centuries. It peaks around the third century Hijri, and then over there it's basically a very, uh, it's, it's a long decline up to uh, modern times. So it's not that we do not have such a tradition, it's that we lost it over time. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that we need to rediscover it. That does not, inc does not mean just digging up our own traditions, it also means reinterpretation, it means engaging with the new ideas, it means engaging with the Western tradition. So the, the destination that I see is not exactly 
It's basically a, a loyal child of two traditions, both the Western liberal tradition and the Islamic tradition. So we're not talking about uh, somehow copying Western ideas. Uh, you see, the human beings all over the world, when they talk about human rights, they end up with the same conclusion. The, the destination will probably look the same. It's just that it's, it's not really the destination, but the process which is important. You need to be able to talk about these things in your own cultural language. Uh, there was a question from, uh, 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 from the, the yes. young lady. What is needed to unite people? Is it what is needed to, yeah. So the thing is, is Islam, I mean, for, for, forget about the scene, the disastrous scene that you see today, but Islam has always been pluralistic. Sex have always, always existed in Islam. It's not, uh, but you know, these kind of sectarian wars only, only start in, nine, in 37 years ago with the, with the rise of the Iranian, uh, Iranian revolution. That's basically what led through, you know, through some process or the other to a sectarianization which actually flared up after 2012, 2013. Uh, so don't, don't make the assumption that this is a, uh, what do you say, uh, and I'm los losing my voice again, but it's not exactly uh, a theological dispute. It's not, th this war is not based upon a theological dispute. Uh, it's a geopolitical war that uses sectarianism as a useful narrative. Uh, as for how to unite people, I'm not sure that sameness equals unity. How to unite people means to really and radically and deeply understand that we don't have to be alike to, to, to like each other. I mean, that's, that's, that's the point. Thank you, Iyad. <laughs> that's a very wise thing. Um, Maha, I thought maybe you would like to address the, the questions on citizenship, since that's also to some extent uh, your special area of focus. Yeah. Uh, just very quickly. Um, I see the future of the region through citizenship. I mean, I don't think we're capable of moving towards any form of uh, democratic transition, any form of a brighter future if they're not based on the values and principles, the rights and obligations of citizenship. Citizenship that is embracive of, uh, of, of difference, that is embracive of the social diversity that characterizes the region. It's just not possible. And I think when we talk about the rec recognizing the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, um, we're also talking about the rights of individuals, but also the rights of communities. And the tension between the rights of individuals and communities exists in the region in the same way as it exists anywhere else. But it, it's a future that has to be based on this, and it has to be embraced. And I th want to link this up with the theme that Yad was talking about, which is the idea of indigenizing uh, uh, liberalism. Um, it, also, indigenizing these values is very much part and parcel of this process. We will not be able to indigenize liberal values without, if it's not also based on fundamental understandings of an inclusive citizenship that embraces diversity and that uh, not only embraces it, actually, that is proud of it and that protects it. I think these are very important uh, I mean, issues. And there you need to start looking at educational systems. I mean, we didn't have time to look at, to talk about these things, but there are very concrete things that can be done and that need to be urgently done uh, to, in order to move in that direction. Education is one of the first uh, places that we do need to start. And I think this is where there's a lot of innovation now happening in terms of OK, we can't do it through government curricula. Let's look at other ways of at least engaging with people and making sure that children learn these values very early on in the same way that they learn the values of democracy and the ways their schools are run. I mean, there are lots of things one can talk about uh, in that way. Um, and on the, on the issue of how do you make people come together, I mean, I think Iyad answered that question more or less. Uh, but I would also just want to remind people the Arab uprisings started were non-ideological. These, these people took to the streets, not because of a certain ideology, and it's very important to remember this. They took to the streets demanding their rights. Um, what happened next is another story. But these were non-ideological uh, demonstrations asking for the fundamental rights of citizenship. Um, and it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, the way they've been sectarianized in some places is very much part of a much larger uh, struggle. Thank you, uh, Ma, and perhaps if you would like to make a concluding remark. Just one, one remark, you know, these talks go on for an hour or two, it all becomes a blur <laughs> after a while, and I always like to focus my mind and see, have I learned at least one new thing? 
And I learned one, or one new thing was, was reinforced for me, and that is, it's something that Iyad said, but what we see today is an extraordinary rise in literacy in the Arab world and the younger generation, and we see a revolution in technology. And that has led, as Iyad said, this has led to a generational shift in the region. We see a new culture of irreverence, a culture of questioning, uh, a culture that is challenging the powers that be. That is something new, and that is very exciting. And that is going to have long-term positive impact. We're all kind of obsessed with how the internet is fueling radicalism and terror and violence, and that's all true. But I think in the long run, this is going to be a very, very positive thing in terms of indigenizing, what you say, liberal culture in the region. Thank you very much, Eva, and I think that's a very good note to conclude this debate on. Um, I would like to uh, thank all of you for being here tonight with us, and um, as usual, I would like to um, invite you to have a drink with us afterwards. Uh, yes, but there will also be an opportunity for that during the drinks. Um, I would like to conclude the debate right now also to give the persons who are observing Ramadan the opportunity to prepare for iftar. So. Um, Thank you very much for being here, and also I would like to uh, thank our distinguished speakers. It's been wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for making the effort to come travel all the way to Amsterdam. Open. <laughs>